Thank you very much. Um, how many of you ever played the game when you were kids? What's different when you looked at the picture? Well, OK. What's different is I am not a data geek. So um, you are um, going to get a little bit different presentation. So um, I am with CARF International, which is an international accreditation system. And we look at the quality of health and human services in 27 different countries. And so we deal with a lot of providers. And when Patricia started to talk to me about this presentation, it was really critical for me to think about what do I hear from providers? And I had lots of information from providers about why they either stopped taking students or were still taking students. And I thought it was critical information that we could share. We do have standards that are new standards that talk about workforce development and management. Those do include students and volunteers, and that could be a resident physician, it could be a nurse, PT, OT, speech, social work, case managers, uh, the whole gamut of people who work within our fields, as well as in behavioral health. So we sent a survey out. We sent out 1,000. 239 were opened and 78 responded. And these were some of the statistics about what they were offering. So clinical internships, of course, was the highest. And then where were they offered, which is interesting when you start to talk about outpatient. And so outpatient was higher than inpatient for rehab providers. And then also in specialty brain injury. Acute care outpatient was only 9%. But when you look at an acute care PT or OT clinic, uh, to have students is, is disruptive in many cases because of the reasons that you're going to hear about. Ages, it was pretty equal. Uh, so there were people who were strictly pediatrics. Others saw both adults and children and adolescents, and some were adults only. So one of the things I wanted to start out with is a positive thought. And this was one of the comments. All of these are comments directly from providers. It's an excellent way to keep our employees current, which is a wonderful opportunity. And it also helps develop people's mentoring and leadership skills. So if you don't actually have a career ladder within your clinic, it's an opportunity for someone who has the potential to learn and grow. And for many people, it's a way to have staff uh, recruitment. Because when you look at the world of uh, rehabilitation, there are many shortages that are critical and people can't provide the care. So the next thing that we um, want you to consider, and this is a reflection picture, so reflect upon some of these comments in a way that you might be able to use them. So if you did not, if you did offer, but you don't now offer any of these opportunities for students, not enough staff who could be preceptors. So again, there's critical shortages across many of these places. And so for them to take on a student, it was too much. But you're going to see a lot about productivity in many of these statements. And that's something that is being forced upon providers. We talk about value, quality over cost, and producing an outcome. So other reasons. There were the perceptions of Medicare rules, and that was mentioned about regulations. There's increasing productivity expectations that therapists, nurses provide more care to more patients. Um, they also, of course, love to blame it on the accreditors. And we say, no, you can't do that. But that's something that is there. And then there are hospitals. Many of our programs are specialty programs within a larger acute care hospitals. And hospitals are putting strict restrictions on how many students can be in that system. And so when you have a smaller unit or a smaller outpatient clinic or a home and community-based service, those acute care settings may be taking more of those positions. So that's a problem. Um, we don't want our therapists to be too busy doing preceptor work not to take new referrals. So they also see the critical idea of that it's important for them to take new patients versus taking a student who they believe will take more time. Um, and then there's increasing caseloads and more demands upon clinicians for documentation, et cetera. If you never offered, again, it was not enough staff and poor communication with the university and college. So it's always good to reflect upon what kind of communication do you have with these people who you want to take your students. And so that's an important part. And then what should education institutions and systems consider when developing or revising their student experiences? And we specifically asked that question to try to give you some information about what actual providers are thinking might be able to improve the situation. So one of the things I think that you're going to see is this, this theme of that students need to understand what's happening in healthcare delivery systems today. It's very different. If you have people who are teaching who have not been out in the system, it's a different world. 
And so they are talking about what they call realistic expectations, the ability to know that you're not going to have two or three hours to do an assessment. You might have 20 minutes to do that assessment. So how do you deal with that? Um, so there's also restrictions on billing that impact what people are going to be able to do. This is one that you just mentioned the fact that hospitals are saying, well, you have to pay me to take your students. And this was a comment that I thought was very interesting because they are saying students pay for their education, tuition to participate in the clinic. My fear is by placing the burden on the clinic sites will substantially impact the number of clinical sites in the future. And that's from someone who wants to take students, has had students, but they're fearing that that financial burden is too much for them to take. Um, very, this is interesting. Students vary so, and I didn't capitalize it, the provider did, so much. Um, they're not prepared for the demands of the work environment. And so you need to think about how are you working on that? They're talking about productivity. They're talking about streamlining priorities, interacting with relevant population. Do you know the population that your students are going to be working with on those clinical sites? What are the factors that you need to know? No. What are the diversity and cultural issues? How are you teaching that? How does that impact care delivery? So those are things that they're um, taking a look at and making sure preceptors have an understanding of their base of knowledge. So the people who are precepting the students, you want them to be prepared for that as well. This came up multiple times that, are you asking providers to come in and lecture? The people who are on the ground, boots on the ground, they're doing it every day, are you asking them to come in and actually share their, the projected trends that they're seeing in any of the care delivery systems and how this is gonna impact the expectations? This was a, um, right from them. We're seeing a large gap between what students and new grads are reporting they are being taught and what their expressed expectations of their role as a student and upon entering the workforce. So there's a disconnect somewhere. Um, and, you know, we're a, a firm believer as an accreditor, you get all the key parties in a room and you get the best thinking from them and then you start to redesign. And that's how we revise standards and how our system works. So thinking about how do you bring those providers that you want to take your students into the classroom to get their feedback and to also have the interchange with the students about what it's really like to be out there. Uh, guidance on how to be a good clinical supervisor, that's something that they want to make sure that they're meeting your needs as well, so they want that assistance with that. And I thought this was interesting. Students that score high in academics do not always do well in clinical settings. They seem to lack communication and social skills needed in the clinical setting. We're very much into person-centered care and CARF standards, and we talk about active listening. We talk about the person served as the expert. Um, how many of your students do you think see that person they're working with as the expert versus they being the expert? And so that misconnect is happening, and we need to, if we're moving toward person-centered care, if we're moving toward value-based purchasing, we need to make sure that the students understand that because that's a critical component. And it's a different way to address your, the person served, as we say, the patient or the um, resident or the client. And so those are things that you need to be thinking about. Willing to take students because we see it as a way of increasing the number of people interested in working in this area. This was someone who was a pediatric placement. It's discouraging to hear when we do interviews for positions that students wanted a pediatric placement, but we're told none were available. Need better communication between university and placement site. So these are people from all over the country. We did this only in the US. We didn't do it internationally. So those are things that are specific to the US. So I'm going to close with this thought. I think this is a quote that we all need to practice. If you want to travel fast, you travel alone. If you want to go far, you travel with others. So I think that those others are the places that you want to place students. How are you actually engaged with them? How are you working with them? How are you listening to them? If you're not doing that, there's going to be this constant conflict because I'll tell you, the world of what I work in is not changing to give people more time, the benefit of more time. There were also lots of comments about um, the use of an electronic health record, the ability to understand salaries and benefits. Um, just because you may have a DPT or DOT, it doesn't mean you're going to get a huge salary necessarily. And so where is that practical kind of what are salary expectations and benefits? So there's lots of discussion that I think needs to go on, and um, hopefully you're open to dialogue and that you'll take a look at those things. So thank you.